this class and gs where we'll be talking about one of the major schemes that is the gold monetization scheme and the sovereign gold bonds now i can say this whole concept or this whole uh, program or policy is based on the concept that all that glitters is not gold if it is kept idle so it's important to bring the gold into circulation now first we'll understand in this class why there has been a bullish trend for gold why there was a need for gold monetization scheme then the details of the scheme and finally the sovereign gold bonds so let's start about the reason for the bullish gold if i talk about the global picture we can say there has been ideas of negative interest rate in countries of europe uh, and japan as well that is one of the foremost reasons reasons then you have the declining interest that has been seen or the decline in the rate of dollar as a result investors are now investing more into gold that is one of the another important reasons then you have the impact of brexit that can be seen in future you have the collapse of eurozone these are some of the reasons that a certain the bullish trend or the increasing price when we say bullish that means increasing so that's increasing price of the gold we can say again in 2016 it was estimated that there was gold mining was at its peak and since it's at its peak in 2016 it is ought to decline by 2017 and 18 and that would again be one of the major reasons for a uh, increase in the price of gold now based on this there is i can say uh, idea that was propounded by various stakeholders in india because if we look at the picture from 1919 2000 to 2010 and 2013 14 we'll see that there has been an increase in the quantity of gold imports the increase in the quantity of gold imports has not been that marked as the rise in the price so this is the price rise which is shooting up in contrast to the quantity of gold so even if i am importing the same quantity of gold as i used to do before i am paying much higher than what i used to pay previously so this was the amount i used to pay in 2010 supposedly for the same amount of gold i would pay this price in 2014 15 so what it means is this gold import which forms an important part of the uh, indian imports i can say is accounting for nearly 2/3 of the current account deficit now current account deficit when i say is i am trying to explain that i am unable to offer uh, goods and services in exchange of the imports that i am taking so this current account deficit which is mainly governed by the gold import needs to be resolved now what are the implications of the current account deficit if i have a current account deficit it would lead to depreciation of the rupee however conventionally i say depreciation of rupee is good it is good in two terms because it decreases the imports since the import is becoming costly the import would decrease and there would be increase in export because our products are now much more cheaper and competitive in the international market this depreciation of rupee i can give a best example you have one usd to rupee rupee conversion which i say is say 66.5 now if i talk about the same usd to indonesian rupiah it's nearly 13000 and 45 indonesian rupee so if us is given an option to import the same product it would definitely opt for indonesia because of the cheaper import since the rate of the rupee indonesian rupee is much less so depreciation in rupee would definitely increase the export and decrease our import but this is what i am talking in conventional terms when i talk about reality this is not the picture because our major imports are first petroleum i am not giving it in the sequential order but these are our major imports i would say fertilizers and gold 
Now these three which are our major imports for India are price inelastic. When I say price inelastic, I mean that with the increase in the price, the demand is not going to fall for these products. For India, if you increase the price of petroleum, the, consum the consumption will not fa fall, the demand will not reduce. Same happens for fertilizer and gold. That means these commodities are price inelastic. Since they are price inelastic, they would incur a negative impact or a negative consequence on the imports that we are doing. As a result, it would negatively affect, I would say it would negatively affect the uh, imports that we are having and that would lead to negative consequences or depreciation of rupee and that negative consequence would lead to increase in the price of essential commodities. So the price of essential commodities would rise. As a result, what is important is to check the import of gold. Now this was the basic idea why or I would say why there is a need to mobilize the gold in Indian economy. Now if we talk about Indian households and institutions, the data predicts that we have around 20,000 tons of gold that has that has been held by Indian households and institutions <coughs> and the cost is nearly 1 trillion. This makes for nearly 50% of the Indian GDP. If even a small fraction of this is mobilized, it would reduce the gold, import, gold imports in India and would improve the Indian economy. So that is the basic idea. Now, there were various methods that were propounded. The first method was propounded was to import, to increase the import duty. So if I increase the import duty, the import of gold would decrease. But this did not work much because it is gold started coming in by illegal channels. So that faced problem. Then there was idea that talked about that if there is the gold that is not into circulation, how will it the jewelry industry in India survive? So it would definitely have a negative consequence or a ne negative impact on the jewelry industry and also gold is associated with the socio-cultural factors in India and it is a kind of item of mass consumption I could say. So as a result there is something else that needs to be done besides increasing the import duty for the gold. So in 1990 there were two schemes that were released. One was gold deposit scheme, the other was gold metal loan scheme. However, in long term it was realized that these schemes were not successful. As a result on 5th November 2015, gold monetization scheme was released. Now, this idea of gold monetization scheme was led forward by the gold ETFs, the electronically traded funds that were released and that started in India in February 2007. <clears throat> it was seen that during a period of 2010, to 2013, there was 10% increase in the uh, amount of gold ETFs that people invested. So this 10% increase in the ETF showed a trend that people are more willing to in, uh, invest into electronically uh, traded funds for gold rather than going for physical funds. As a result, under this gold monetization scheme, there were three ideas that were propounded. One was the short term scheme, the middle term scheme and the long term scheme. The short term scheme was for a period of 1 to 3 years that is introduced by the bank itself. Middle term from 5 to 7 years and long term from 12 to 15 years and both of these were introduced by government of India and were notified by RBI and finally executed by the bank. Now what was the objective for this monetization scheme? The basic idea was to increase the liquidity so market liquidity should be increased then converting gold which is being dead or i could say ideal in most of the households to a performing asset and generating revenue out of it reducing the import burden that the indian economy has and this reduction in the import of gold would lead to or would reduce the current account deficit that india is bearing and finally 
this could be available as raw material on loan that could be taken by the from the banks now this is how the gold mobilization takes place so if you try to understand the process of mobilization i can see if i am a gold owner i'll go to the bank i'll ask the bank to open a gold saving account or a gold saving deposit scheme so this gold saving account would ask you to bring in the gold from the assaying center so this is the collection or the assaying center unit what happens here is there are two processes that that are involved the first is the xrf machine process in this process the gold is held as it is it remains intact in the form of jewelry and it takes around 45 minutes and you are assessed with the approximate purity of the gold once you agree that you are ready to go for the gold saving scheme this gold all it all of it would be cleaned studs would be removed and then melted into bricks and finally uh, the go the gold jewelry would lose its form and it would be formed in the form of bars coins or uh, blocks i could say and this process takes around 3 to 4 hours at the assessing center where it is fire burned in front of you and everything happens in front of the person who is applying for the scheme after that point also you have an option to pay the charges of the assaying center the hallmarking center and take your gold along or you have the option of investing into the gold monetization scheme if you agree to invest into the gold monetization scheme what happens is the gold is sent for preparation to the refinery and, sim and simultaneously the bank is informed about the uh, the amount that needs to be credited to the customer both these process happen simultaneously once the gold is sent as a uh, from the refinery it goes to the jeweler and jeweler repays the metal loans into the cash form and this is the process how the gold loans work out so the below process explains the gold lending process or the loan process and the above explains the saving account that is opened on the customer behalf now <coughs> when we talk about understanding this structure it is important that this scheme has many benefits now i can divide these benefits as benefits to customers benefits to government and tax benefits first let's talk about the tax benefit when i say tax benefit i can say this is in interest free income so you have no income tax you have no capital gains no uh, wealth tax that has been assessed on the interest income then what are the major benefits to the customer the first major benefit is the gold is growing it's not remaining ideal so the gold is now a performing asset so this gold becomes a performing asset next you need not to bear the locker expense you need not to have security concerns for the gold that you are carrying you are getting cash value out of it after the period for which you have applied you can get the interest as cash or kind so you have both the option you can go for kind or cash if you go for cash it's fine if you go for kind there is 2.5% uh, sorry 0.2% administrative charges that are levied and these charges after these charges you are given the uh, sim the exact amount of gold that forms the interest income however <coughs> there are certain benefits that the government who has for this scheme first of all if the gold that is ideal in the indian households is brought into circulation it would lead to decrease in the current account deficit that the government is bearing it would lead to decrease in the gold imports that india is doing and finally it would also be beneficial to the gold and the jewelry sector and it would reduce the borrowing cost however there are certain disadvantage that this scheme faces the first is disadvantage is you have to part away from the actual gold jewelry that you have the next is since you are parting away you are reducing the amount because you have the impurities that are reduced so the amount of real gold that is obtained is less as compared to the actual gold that you are putting in and finally some of the people have sentiments associated to it so the gold jewelry would definitely lose its shape 
So these are some of the major issues or major disadvantage that this scheme faces. Next are certain challenges that are faced by this scheme. The first is the risk management. Since the government is bearing the cost, if, the rise, uh, if there is a sharp price rise for the gold, then there is a risk that need to be borne by the government. So there is risk management. That's the first challenge. The next challenge is there is a continuous lust for gold to buy gold and to keep gold in physical form. And finally, there is uh, the gold that has been uh, through the familial uh, history that has been going on. So it's hard to track the, uh, the real taxable person besides that uh, gold. So you have a kind of uh, black money, I could say, or the illegal money that has become questionable here. So most of the people who are uh, who have kind of unaccounted gold cannot uh, straight away apply for this scheme. So that is one of the major drawbacks. Besides that, there was gold uh, deposit scheme that we have already talked about. Under gold deposit scheme, it's again tax free, but there is no option for pre premature withdrawal as it is in the case of uh, the other schemes. And finally, uh, certain examples, the certain well-known examples who contributed to gold monetization scheme are Tirupati Balaji, the famous temples, Tirupati Balaji, it contributed around 5.5 uh, tons of gold. Then you have the Siddhivinaya temple, it contributed around 44 kg of gold. And finally, you have the Sai Baba Shirdi, which contributed around 500 kilograms of gold under this scheme. Government is also, offer, is also offering another scheme, that's the Ashok Chakra gold coin schemes. Under this scheme, the gold coins would be minted with the Ashok Chakra, the Indian emblem, and they would be available in the denominations of 5 grams and 10 grams. And the, the cost of these Ashok Chakra would be, uh, the Ashok Chakra gold coins would be less than the actual market price. So these are some of the benefits that you have for uh, the different schemes that is launched. Now finally you have the Sovereign Gold Bond Scheme. Now Sovereign Gold Bond Scheme was a scheme that was released by government again on the same account that if people are more interested to invest in gold, and they invest in gold schemes by means of sovereign gold bond schemes. There would be around 300 tons per year that would be brought into circulation. And that would shift the burden from the real gold. So what is happening in this scheme is the government issues a certificate to the owner. You can buy gold in the denomination of 5, 10, 5 grams, 10 grams, 50 grams and 100 grams. There is a maximum cap of 500 grams per year per person. The interest is again tax free. Uh, you have a, uh, this is, you can hold this for a period of 8 years. You have an exit option starting from the 5th year. Now, what is levied here is capital gains if you are opting for a period of 5 to 7 years because there is an option of premature withdrawal that is allowed under this scheme. So, what is capital gains? Let's understand that first. So, under capital gains, you can have short term or long term gains. If you have short term, it's less than 36 months or 3 years. Long term is greater than 36 months or 3 years. Under short term capital gains, you are uh, uh, the gains is accounted based on the income tax slab. However, for long term, it is straight 20%. But in case of gold sovereign bond scheme, if you are applying for a period of 8 years and you are blocking your gold till a period of 8 years, then you will have no capital gains if you are uh, withdrawing money at full maturity. Again, there is an interest rate of 2.75% plus the appreciation of gold that would take place under the, gold, uh, the sovereign gold bond scheme. This is mainly managed by banks and uh, the uh, post, post offices etc. How does the government decide the price of the gold? The price of the gold is decided based on the previous week's average from Monday to Friday for gold at 9.99 purity. And this is published at, uh, this is given by the Indian Boolean and Jewelers Association, IBJA. And finally, 
revealed on the RBI website two days before the scheme opens. Till now, there have been four rounds of the sovereign gold bond schemes that have uh, taken place and the interest on these bonds would be taxable as per the Indian Income Tax Act and the capital gains treatment would be the same as that for the physical gold that has been declared under this scheme. Now these are the four rounds that have taken place so far. The first round was really uh, a kind of, kind of unsuccessful round with only accumulation of 916 kg of gold. The issue prices for the various four rounds are given, the total amount that has been invested so far has been given and the total gold which accounts for now is 2.95 tons that is the highest collection during the fourth round. Now if we try to compare the physical gold, gold ETF and sovereign gold bonds, here are some of the major differences that you can see. First of all you have an exit option from fifth year. So you have trade options that are available. There is no capital gains if you hold till maturity as we explained. However, for physical gold and ETF you have long term capital gains that is applicable after 3 years. It is uh, both of these sovereign gold, form, uh, bold, gold bonds and ETF are in electronic form. They can be either in DMET form or in paper based form. And you have uh, for physical gold you always have a risk of handling the gold in contrast to the ETF and the gold bonds where you don't have that burden of holding the gold. So these are some of the basic highlights of the gold monetization scheme. Now most of the government policies that we would be doing we will be discussing with an unbiased opinion. Uh, we will be focusing on the main policy its objectives uh, from the perspectives of objective questions as well as subjective questions. Uh, you can subscribe to our channel for more lessons on GS. Have a good day ahead.